as I matured, I started realizing, well, no, it's quite, it's sometimes the simplest answer is the correct one, which is that they don't know. They didn't know the answer. What's happening, everybody? This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 740. My guest today is Sensei Joe Andrews. I'm your host for the show, Jeremy Lesniak, the founder of Whistlekick. And I founded Whistlekick because I not only love traditional martial arts in all forms, but I wanted opportunities to meet other traditional martial artists and support them in their journey because I know what my training has done for me. And if you want to see how that's manifested, all the different things that we're working on, go to whistlekick.com. We've got everything from Marshall Journal, a content website. We've recently rolled out awards. We've got our great Patreon. And we've got a store where we make some stuff. Check out the stuff that we make from training programs to gear to hoodies to lots of cool stuff. And if you use the code podcast15, it's going to save you 15% on the cool stuff we got over there to help you live your martial arts lifestyle, whatever that means to you. The podcast has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because we do so much with this. We bring you two episodes each week. And it's all to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide, no matter who you are, what you do, why you do, how you do, doesn't matter. We are style agnostic at Whistlekick. We're not a karate brand or a taekwondo brand. We're a martial arts brand. We love traditional martial arts in all forms. And if you want to support us, yeah, you can make a purchase, but you could also do lots of quick, easy, free stuff. You can leave us reviews. You can share episodes. You can follow us on social media. It's all good, and we appreciate every bit of it. We do have a Patreon that people seem to really enjoy. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick starts at two bucks. If you like what we do, if you find it of value, please consider supporting us in some way, the Patreon being one of the most effective. But if you want the entire list of all the ways you can help us out, Whistlekick.com slash family. You got to type it in. We update it weekly. Fun behind the scenes stuff. It's a good page. Check it out. I had a great time talking to Sensei Joe. We talked about all the stuff that you might expect we would talk about. And it was a wonderful conversation. And I'm just going to let you listen. Because that's why you're here. <laughs> Hello there. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm very well. I should say good morning to you guys, shouldn't I? It, it is, yeah. Nine good morning. Here. And uh, yes. a bit after lunch for you? Yeah, yeah. It's two o'clock here. Let's go. Let's awesome. Go. Let's go. Awesome. Let's do it. I appreciate the faith. So let's start here. <laughs> How did you get started in martial arts? Okay, so I started uh, in traditional Shotokan karate back in 1998. Uh, so why? I would have been why? It's not a very inspiring reason. Um, it was actually because my mum's friends' kids also did traditional Shotokan, and I think. She thought I'd find it interesting. It was because before then I was doing gymnastics mm. and um, an, an, an unusual interest, but I I got older, I got taller, and I, I kind of outgrew the gymnastics instructor. So I think she politely said to my mum, I think, I think you need something else. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Um, I, I can't get him over the, <laughs> over the vault. So, um, so that was her, that was actually my mum's suggestion, um, for me to get into it. And so I suppose I took it as seriously as any other kid would have done going into an activity. Um, it was only when I started taking it seriously, when I got into my first schoolyard fight mm. and, and, and won. I really thought, okay, this fight could have occurred very differently uh, in any other circumstance. So I started to take yeah. my training seriously. And at this point, I was probably about, I was a purple belt, so I would have been about fourth or fifth Q. Okay, and how old? Oh, I must have been maybe 13. Okay. So old enough to that. recognize that, you know, fights didn't always work out. You know. Yeah. Yeah, Some I mean, consequences it was, there. Yeah, it, it was it was a fight that should never have happened. It was it was. I had an argument with a friend, and his friend didn't like that I was arguing with him, and it just turned into um, quite a nasty fight. 
Hmm. And um, and we've been all right ever since, actually, the guy that, <laughs> that started the fight. Um, and I took my... And actually, it was around that time that you would expect to start taking your training seriously anyway, because it's actually quite a good... It's, it was good timing when it happened. Yeah. So by that point, I was going through my brown belt grades where you were expecting to take it very seriously. Okay, so you'd been training for two, three years? Almost, yeah, about this time, yeah. Okay. And, you know, I, I always find the why. I find the... the the reasons that people not only join, but remain to be really interesting. You're talking about joining for kind of a different reason, you know, Hey, Hey, he's too tall for this. We gotta, we gotta move him over here. Uh, yeah. 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 But at an age that, you know, you had, you had some friends training then, but you know, my understanding of the martial arts space in the UK is that it's fairly similar to the U S that you kind of have a hole around adolescence, you know, up eight, nine, 10. And then, you know, early teens, not really so interested in training. Yeah, exactly right. But now, it was something that, that even beyond, you know, the validation of a school schoolyard fight, you found of interest. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, that's, that's, it's interesting you bring that up because that's a subject that we've been talking about for many, many years. And in, in the days when I was doing traditional Shotokan, whenever that question was asked, why is there a huge demographic gap in karate? We're talking, let's say, 16 to 35 or something like that. Sure. And the answer was always, well, they're going off to university, they're starting their lives, you know, getting married, having kids, getting careers and all that. But the reality is, is that they're not doing karate. They're doing boxing, judo, jiu-jitsu, MMA. I mean, in certainly in recent years, that has definitely been the case. Which, which is which is kind of which kind of nicely sits with what we do now. So, whereas I used to do traditional Shotokan, I've progressively moved everything towards applied karate, mm -hmm. which is holding your hands up and saying. Yeah, sometimes karate doesn't have all the answers, but then neither does judo, neither does jiu-jitsu, neither does boxing. So it's it's having it's having the bravery to stand up and go, yeah, okay, let's collaborate, let's um, cross train. To say it another way, it's about being held to a positive outcome rather than a restricted methodology. Exactly, exactly that. Okay, which is which I guess is why. I guess it's why I try. I I don't tend to refer to myself as Shotokan anymore. I ju I just say that we do karate because the for two reasons, mainly because the association that we're in, so we're in the British Combat Association, mm -hmm. um, is nobody cares what you do. Nobody cares what style you came from. Nobody cares what style you do. You don't come into a room and go, you know, Wado, Goju, Kaigashin. Mm. No one cares. You just you just go there and you learn stuff. You collaborate, you network, you share ideas. Yeah. Which that nicely fits in with the way that I've started to feel in recent years about styles, how how the start how the terminology of style in karate has changed over 100 150 years whereas yeah. it, it was it was literally this is how i do it and this is how he does it, or this is how she does it whereas these days it's an institution yeah and certainly maybe that's a little bit harsh but that's certainly how i i, I don't i don't think how, it is how i see it i don't think it is I, I think if you take a step back if you're able to remove your own ego from it and 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 recognize that um the value of lineage is has nothing to do with quality. Hmm. There's value in it for a lot of people, myself included, but it's not about because this is old or went through this person, it's better. Exactly. You know, I'm, that. I'm, listeners, I'm using air quotes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I don't know if it was ever the intention. Um, maybe it was just my instructor. I don't know. But you, you didn't really train with anyone else other than. Shotokan. 
you, 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 it mm. was it was not just an institu- institutional style, but there was a system. There was a very tight knit syllabus, and your entire life was dedicated to perfecting that system. So instead of branching out, learning new things, training with new people, and sharing ideas, like I was just saying, it's it's about training with people that can help you to perfect the thing that you already know. Mm. And just to be clear, that's not the reason why I left Shotokan. It was that it was more so that I actually and I actually fell out with my instructor. We're not on good terms now, and um, it was only because um, a friend of mine, Andy Kidd, who's in the BCA, uh, recommended it. I was looking for a Shotokan association, and he said, "No, you know, go go to something that's going to give you a little more freedom." So I so I did, and it was within being a part of that association. So this is headed by uh, Peter Constantine and Jeff mm-hmm. Thompson. Um, that it is all about inclusivity. Like I say, you, know, you, know, you, you go to a course. It's not a Shotokan course. It's not, even, it's not even really a crappy course. It's just, you know, come and train with this guy or come and train with this person. It's, it, it's, it's, it's networking. It's yeah. come, and, come and see what I do. And then if you host a course, I'll come and see what you do. And, that, that word that's how you, that's freedom. How you make friends. Yeah, I, I like that word freedom in there it, because we, we've we've talked about this subject. We've had folks on the show, and and for listeners who pay attention to what we do on on our Thursday episodes, we often talk about the value of of cross training, of diversity in practice, etc. And we've had you know we've had Ian Abernethy on the show. We've had Samir Barado on the show. You know the two names coming to mind most for. Folks were saying, you know, like let's let's let style fall away and like let's charge forward with what what works in karate. But what I'm what I'm kind of seeing is we're almost going full circle because if you know your karate history, the quote styles that are trained today in karate primarily came from people who trained with a bunch of other different people and said this is what works for me. And some of them even went so far as to say, don't call it a style. Exactly. Exactly. And so how we ended up in that place, hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's it's the way that karate got globalized. Maybe that principle got lost. But it's interesting how in a matter of years, I ended up moving from one karate community to another. Instead of there being one karate community, or even a martial art community, if you want to broaden it, but I went from being in a traditional community to an applied or practical or... um pragmatic community that is saying, no, we're going to try and get karate back to the way it used to be mm. when it was in Okinawa, when pe- when it was literally, you know, come and train with me, I can do this. Or you can go train with this guy. Um, but with modern approach. Yeah. Which I which I was I was completely taken in by. I, I was like, yeah, I'm 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 all about that. Let's do that. Let's go and train with people. There it's 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 putting your hands up and saying there are people that know more than I do. And if they're willing to share that knowledge, then let's collaborate. Sure. That's, that's the, that's the point. Now you, you mentioned that you had a falling out with your instructor and I, and I don't need to pull that thread. No, I'm, I'm, any, I'm happy to happy of you to pull it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in, inject the information on that. If, if you choose with this, as you answer this question. Anytime someone seems to transition from a thing they've done for a while, especially a martial art where they they wrap at least a part of their identity in it more and more as they progress in rank. You talked about the codification of Shotokan. I, I trained in Shotokan for a time. It's a it's a wonderful system, and some of my best friends are involved, still involved in Shotokan. And and I know what it was like for me leaving that. I know what it's like what it's been like for me leaving any school as I move away or, or, or have a falling out or something. You left a thing to go to a thing. Was that difficult internally for you? I guess not because that wasn't the primary reason. Mm. So when, so the first, the first ever seminar I went to under the BCA was one being hosted by Ian Abernethy and Peter Constantine. So this is actually the first time I ever met um, Peter. Uh, this was, of course, up in um, Leeds, up mm-hmm. north from the UK. And um, 
I didn't know barely anybody. The only person I knew was Andy Kidd, um, who I knew previously. Because mm-hmm. um, he actually used to be in the same association as me. That's how we knew each other. And um, I got talking to a lot of a lot of people, you know, introducing myself and talking to people. And the thing I noticed very quickly was that the guys that were in the BCA had taken exactly the same journey as me, that they were just several years ahead. The difference was that they left their association, so they left their styles because they wanted more. They wanted to expand their training and they felt restricted. So they, 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 they came and joined the BCA. They wanted freedom. I wasn't looking for freedom. I was looking for somewhere else to go and I discovered freedom. So that's the major difference is that, um, the yes, yeah, so the reason that I left um, my old association was nothing to do with the association. Actually, mm-hmm. it was it was because I fell out with my with my instructor. Which I mean, to try and make a big big story small, because uh, this happened over a matter of about four years, was that um, I was his senpai. I was his assistant instructor, and he was a an avid follower of what he would call Funakoshi Ru. Mm-hmm. So he he believed in the a lot of the uh, old fashioned customs of karate. Like he be- he believed that karate was either life or nothing, mm. and he believed that if you were going to commit your life to karate, it, it, there was nothing short of a hundred percent. You had to eat, breathe, drink, sleep karate. There was no exception, which. That's inspiring for people that want to make karate a hundred percent part of your life, but sometimes that's not possible. And I don't think he could quite understand when anyone, even if it was someone giving it, you know, seventy five percent of their life to karate, he just couldn't understand. He couldn't get that into his head. Um, he was he was um, uh, a direct instructor of uh, Enoida, Ota, and various mm. other instructors in the JKA. And, um, but no, the reason I actually fell out with him was because, um, he had interesting thoughts on what were the responsibilities of a senpai. So, which included things like, um, watching his house when he goes away on hot, when he, when he goes away on vacation, uh, looking after his dog. Um, he had two allotments in two different villages and I had to go and water them. Um, I used to take classes in his absence. So he, so we, uh, he taught karate and Tai Chi and I did Tai Chi with him for, um, a decade or two. And I was taking those classes, but I wasn't getting paid for it. Hmm. I wasn't getting anything for any of these things. It was, it was, it was kind of taught to me that it was part of my duty. Hmm. So, sounds um, like the, the kind of cliche apprentice master relationship that we see from, you know, films supposedly cast back a few hundred years exactly exactly and i guess a lot of the issue with that is that in our culture a lot of my friends a lot of my family couldn't understand that kind of relationship whereas i i was engulfed in it so i understood it and it was only like i said like i said this this occurred over about four years where i started like little red flags were coming up and okay that's not normal that's and um, it was all sort of like, can you, do, can you do me a favor? Can you water my plants when we go away? Can you do me a favor? Can you, what, can you look, you know, teach these classes? And it happened more and more and more, and the occurrences were longer and longer and longer. Mm. And it got, and the major red flag was he, he gave me a list one year and said, these are all the classes that we need you to teach over the year. And it was many, many weeks. And he and said, this includes looking after my dog, looking after the allotments. And, um, yeah, that was a pretty big red flag, um, yeah. that he would, that he had, he, he had his own idea of what the responsibilities of the senpai was. Now, just to be clear, it, this, I said there was, I kind of implied there was no reciprocation. Um, he, he was, I, I wasn't paying for training at this sure. point. Um, because I, but, but in, in return, he was expecting 100% commitment. So I was training with him six times a week. Mm. So karate, tai chi courses, seminars and everything. So I was already kind of giving a a lot of my time as it was. 
And it was only um, when one occasion where he was going away and I couldn't, for, there was lots of reasons. My, my sister-in-law wasn't very well. My wife was seven months pregnant. It was just, it was, it was just all getting too much. And I thought, well, I got to go to work as well as doing all of this stuff. And I actually had to confront him and say, look, I can't do it. I'm really sorry. I know I, we need some kind of alternative plan. And, um, I can't, I can't swear, but he basically told me to do one. Mm, yeah. Quite, quite bluntly. Like, you know, mm. we're getting in the car. Let's go. Like just left me behind. It was, it was that, it was that harsh. Mm. And you could, you know, at this point he'd been my instructor for 20 years. He, he, he taught me a lot about karate, a lot about life, a lot of, you know, he, he was a clever guy. He just wasn't very good at applying that into normal life. And so it took me about three days to kind of get to grips with what the hell just happened. Mm. And I, I bucked up the courage to, to say I'm, I'm parting ways and it didn't go well. Um, Wouldn't have expected go down, it to. No, yeah. it didn't go down very well at all. And he, he actually gave me some quite nasty online abuse for about three years. Mm. And that was about seven years ago. Just just made me feel a little bit better about... Um, so I, I didn't take it personally. I just... All, every Everything that he said and did just made me happier that I left. Yeah, it was validating. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So yeah, I'm in a much better a happier a place with my training my training has direction um and as as an instructor now obviously i have a lot of um um experience with teaching mm. before i said before i said before i started uh, my own organization but i was able to say well what do i want and what do i not want which is that's something that that's a principle i use in life in general is that sometimes you've got to know the bad to know mm. what is good strip strip the bad and you get left with what you actually want and that's what's made me a better teacher can you talk about that process you know that that thoughtful process of okay here here's the body of of work here's what what karate is to me at this point the point where you you transition out and you look at it and there are i'm sure it's it's even different now from then but that first examination to say i want to keep this I want to take this out. Hmm. Do you do you remember what that was like? How you approached it? Yeah, it was um, it was a long process of trying to find the answers to questions that weren't answered for me hmm. in the past. Such as, I mean, even uh, I mean, even an example like what do, what do you do if you end up on the floor? And the answer was always. Well, don't end up on the floor. Karate is not <laughs> karate is not a ground martial art. You put people on the floor, don't take them to the floor. Yeah, I respect that. But what if I end up on the floor accidentally? What if I trip? What if I fall? What if they know what they're doing and they put me on the floor? They will stand back up again. Now, at the time, I just kind of played ignorance and went, yeah, okay, it's not part of the system. But as I matured, I started to realize, well, no, it's quite... It's, Sometimes the simplest answer is the correct one, which is that they don't know. They didn't know the answer. Or they weren't taught the answer to that right. question, so they couldn't answer that question. So it's having a little bit of... Um, it's being a bit humble, I suppose, and saying, you know, I, if they just said, I don't know the answer to that question, go and train with someone that does. But that wouldn't have been the right answer because they wanted me to train with them. Hmm. So that's, that's, I mean, that's one example. So that's, again, that is something that I take and I go, right, okay, I need to answer that question. So I'm going to go and learn some jujitsu and go and learn from someone that can answer that question. What happens if I end up on the floor? Even if it's the basics, even if it's not wrapping somebody up like a pretzel, it's just how do you go into a mountain position, a, a, a guard position, a side control position. And I can pass that information on to my students and say, if you end up on the floor, we actually did, we actually did a class like this. We said, we're actually going to do a throw and the partner's going to take you with them. Mm. And when you go down, I want you to, I want you to try and fall into one of these positions and try and take the dominant position. Not for competition, not for self-defense. Just as a good, 
just a good drill, a good drill to just drill into your head and go, if I fall over sideways, try and go inside control, try and control the arm, get the leg over, I'm in the mouth. Yeah. Answering questions that couldn't be previously answered for me. Um, that whole thing about um, stripping the good from the bad, I actually, <laughs> interestingly, I learned, I first learned that principle, not from karate, but I, when I was training to be a graphic designer, which was my old career. Oh. Um, which was, um, I was very much like, I was always my, my first idea is my best idea. I was, mm-hmm. I was that kind of graphic designer. And they said, no, what you've got to do is you've got to do a whole load of doodles. Just get a page, scribble all over it, 30, 40, 50 designs. Only can you, when you do that, can you then go through and I want you to split it in half. The ones that are good, ones that are not. Then you take those ones that are good. You do a nice, you know, dark pen drawing. Right. Once you've done that, then you strip it again. You split it 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, all the way through until you end up with three designs and you present them. And so not the most inspiring of roots as to where that principle came from, but that taught me that you have to know what the bad ideas are to finalize or get to the point where you know what the good idea is. And, and I think just as importantly, and, and you might say it's an uninspired source, but I, I actually quite disagree. It's okay. quite brilliant that maybe there's a lot of repetition in that. Maybe you're doing a lot of different things, but it's recognizing the necessity of throwing stuff against the wall, knowing yeah. that, you know, out of 50, you're going to hate 40. Yeah. But you have to go through that process. And I think if we if we look back at, at all of our time in early days training, for those of us that have, I, I don't have any, but for those of us that have early video of our first few classes or our first competition or something, and you look at it and you're like, I was terrible. Hmm. But you're only terrible in hindsight. Yeah. And Absolutely. as you got better as a graphic designer, it's not that your the equivalent of your best designs from your early days became the standard and you said, oh, those are fine. I can use the first three now. Yeah. Your standards continue to evolve and you still threw out 47 to get yeah. to the good three. Yeah. And the principle in that is that I could have just done one drawing and gone, yeah, that's fine. But it was going through that process that I realized that was, even if I, even if I came to the end point that was the same as my first doodle, I've still gone through that journey to go, yeah, that is my best idea. I wouldn't have known that if I'd not done 49 other drawings. And I've taken that principle. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between that and martial arts, but I found the correlation. So now I go, well, I know what doesn't work, which means I know what does. Mm -hmm. And certainly with the kind of karate that we do, which is a lot more tried and tested, and it's partner-based, it's you, you learn we learn our material compliantly, then non-compliantly to ensure that students understand. And this is something that I've been trying to uh, push on the online community is as, as teachers, we have to be responsible to say you can't just say this works. And even even more so, you cannot just get your students to train it compliantly because they'll only be able to perform it compliantly. You have to be able to then drill the exercise on a partner that's less compliant to then realize what does and does not work. And I think that's where the big journey from what I used to do to what I do now is, is so important in my karate career. Mm. And it's so interesting to, to see people go through this transition. I've, I've, I don't want to say I've gone through it. I was very fortunate in my early training that my instructors were very wide open. You know, this is what we do, but we want you to do other stuff too. You don't have to know that for your next rank, but we encourage you to learn it. You know, we want you to, right? But I've I've been around enough of it and had some kind of minor epiphanies that set me back and say, oh, this thing that I thought worked actually doesn't work. I don't have to throw the whole lot of it out, but there's enough here that I've got to work back through and it, it seems that the longer people stay in what they do, the, the older someone is when they have that kind of realization that you had, the less likely they are to throw it away or to put it aside or to start over or whatever you want to term it. Because it, 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 can, it can feel wasteful. 
oh, I just put all this time in on this when I look at it as no, you only got here because you put that time in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I have to remind myself sometimes of that. I, I go over the stuff that I used to do for 20 years and, um, I sometimes get a little bit down and I go, wow, that was a lot of material that I trained thousands and thousands of times that I don't do anymore. But then I have to keep slapping myself in the face and reminding myself that it's the trans it's, it's that it's the transition from that to what I do now. If that had never occurred, I may not be where I am now, which goes back to my previous analogy, which is that I have to know what not to do so that I know that what I am doing is right. So for one example, we were always taught to do a low guard. That's fine in the realms of karate, but in the realms of combat, it's not, not applicable. So that's why even, even highly regarded uh, karate um, icons, like people say, even in the, the, in the cage fighting world, like Leo Machida and George St. Pierre, you know, they've got karate history, but they come in with high guards. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine a traditionalist would probably look at that and go, why is their guard so high? It's because, because it's, it's, not, it's not negotiable. It's right. What they're doing is correct. You have a high guard. I, I would use a different word it, because it works. Because yeah. when, you, when you pick of the options and you test things, you find that maybe it's not 100%, maybe not this thing works for 100% of people in 100% of circumstances, but we're playing odds. Yeah. And, if it, and if it works for... 90% of people in 90% of circumstances, well, then you should probably do that. Mm. Instead of being wrapped up in, this is what I was taught. This is what this person said. If you've got yeah. the choice between what's probably going to work and what you were taught, I'm going to go with what's probably going to work. Exactly that. And that's, and that's what our community is all about. It's saying, practice this because it works. And certainly this is something I've been talking a lot about recently is that let's pretend for a moment or maybe it's not even pretending maybe it is true the traditional i'm i'm generalizing traditional karate here so sure. forgive me but if if traditional karate is not about combat it's not about self defense let's say it is about discipline it's about perfecting oneself um self esteem confidence teamwork maybe even going into the realms of competitive karate. That's great. I respect that. But if you're going to choose the medium of combat of which to channel those, those skills, those crucial life skills, it's got to work. I think, that's, I think that's kind of... I can say that because I did it. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine probably a lot of people on the online community would, would be upset by me saying that. But I can say that because I did it. I've done the, you know, the constant higgetes to a head height punch and being taught that you can punch somebody in the face whilst not protecting your own face. Mm. Whereas, as you quite rightly put it, that it has been tried and tested that to protect your own head to attack somebody else's in either competitive or self defense aspects, that that is that is that it's a system that works. So it just interests me if somebody from a tra from the traditional standpoint could hold their hands up and go, yeah, yeah, okay, it's not a self defense system, it's not a combative system. I said, well, in that case, pick a different channel yeah. to channel what you are trying to offer. And this is something that I've been talking a lot on um, on forums about: is saying, be open with what you teach. Um, what you know it's asking the the black and white question what do you teach do you teach people how to fight if so you are teaching people how to fight if you're teaching people how to uh acquire the skills to enter competitions then tell people that's what you do whereas if you're looking from a more military disciplined you know push-ups if your belt isn't the right length either side tell people that's what you do or, or at least advertise that that is what sure. you do Sure. And, and, you know, I, I'm going to guess you'll agree with this statement. It doesn't mean that 100% of what you do has to be that thing, but there, mm. it should be clear 
which of those things are and are not. There's I, I see value in one step and three step sparring. But if that's the primary implementation of free form movement, there's quite a delta between the skill that that brings you and your ability to apply that in a street confrontation or even in competition. Hmm. And if that's the goal, if that's where you want your students to be able to go, if you tell them, I will help you be this, then what you do, you should be able to work backwards and say, okay, you know, instead of doing this 40% of the time, maybe we do it 3% of the time. There's value, but it's not the greater value. So we should do this instead. Yeah. I just think if, if you, you, you have the responsibility as a teacher to teach material that either the, either the students are going to use or in a certain circumstance, they could use it. So if mm-hmm. we're talking about combat, if I'm teaching my students to be able to defend themselves, it's my re- responsibility to make sure that I'm offering the best tuition, even if they never have to use it. But it's giving people hope, I suppose, is, is um, the Hollywood term to use. Um, to, it's, it's, and not creating false hope. So giving somebody a black belt is, is to a lot of people saying, yeah, this is clarification that I can look after myself. Mm. And it's my responsibility to ensure that, that my students will be able to feel that way at some point. So it's my responsibility to make sure that what I'm teaching them is at least tried and tested. Mm. And that's something that used to worry me in my traditional days. It, it, it wasn't even my club, but it still worried me. But I you were, you were sure. aware that there was a gap. Hmm. Yeah, I genuinely um, would look, you know, I'd go to courses and seminars. I'd be looking down the line at uh, all of these black belts and thinking, I don't believe that they'll be able to look after themselves if they, if they, if they were confronted with a verbal or physical altercation. I genuinely believe that. Yeah, and, and I've witnessed this, the same thing. We talked at the top about why, why you got started. Yeah. Why do you continue? I guess, which actually leads nicely on from what I just said, which is, is I have a responsibility to not only keep karate going, but to help push karate into the future. Mm. So as a tradition, as an ex-traditionalist, which in its definition is preserving the past, but there, the, but there's material that will help push it into the future, and that's the world I'm in now. Is that we're we're in a community of fellow martial artists. I I, I use the term martial artists because because we don't want to get institutionalized again and making everything really tight and saying just karate. We train with people to do karate and something else. We do courses with people that don't do karate. They do something completely different, Aikijutsu and Jiu Jitsu uh, and all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's, it's moving karate forward and saying, how can we make it better? I'm actually part of that community that is saying, how do we make karate better? How do we change people's perceptions of karate? Because if you ask the general public, certainly, I don't know about the US, but certainly in the UK, they'll, they'll say that they'll, they'll, they'll narrow karate down to two things. It's uh, the Karate Kid series and that thing we used to do as a kid. Yeah. That's basically it. People have no other ties. That's how the public would see it. And um, actually, it's interesting that we, we understand the differences between different martial arts, but the public don't. So no one ever comes to me and says, how's your karate going? People go, how's your taekwondo going? How's your judo going? How's your jujitsu? How's your kung fu going? They do what they do. They have to do the and hand Most thing. of them don't mean it disparagingly. <laughs> some some no. of them might. Some of them might be poking fun. But to most of them, these are all interchangeable terms because they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not criticizing them. Absolutely not. Because they, they, they don't know. No, you can't criticize them. Somebody for not knowing something. And um, so I guess that's we're, 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 
we're trying to look at how to move karate forward within and without of the karate community. So that's a big thing in our, in mm. our uh, promotion. We're not trying to talk about how awesome we are. We're trying, to, we're trying to advertise, look, this is what karate is. Whatever you think it is, this is what it actually is. So we have to use a lot of video footage. We, have, we, we, we film classes and try and put it out there and say, you know, this is whatever you think it is, it's, it's a lot more than what you think it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's, of- within, that's within and without. That's, that's in and out of the karate community and the martial art community. And what has the response been? I mean, we know what the response has been from it. At least the most vocal elements of the karate community. I'm sure it's been rah, 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 right. Like I'm not even going to use words. It's that tone, rah, 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 right? Because we get we get some. That's of the, pretty uh, accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what what about the folks who, you know, maybe maybe aren't that? How are they receiving this content that you're putting out? Are they supportive? Do they understand? Do they say I don't get it? Like. Yeah, it's. I think because it's a subject that people aren't fully uh, understanding of, it's a case of coming and trying it. Whereas, uh, like in, in in the UK, it's all about football, rugby, and cricket. Sure. Those are our those are our main sports. They are seasonal sport and, te- and tennis as well. Nuts about tennis. Even if you don't do those sports, you have a basic understanding of how it works. Mm-hmm. Whereas with martial arts. No, people don't understand that even on a basic level, the judo's grappling, jiu on the floor, karate's kicking and punching. The, the, the basics, even people don't understand that. So when people... I can only talk on behalf of the people that come and train with us. I don't know sure. about other clubs. But they come to us and they, they, it's like anything else. They either stay or they go. And if they stay, they might stay for a year, two, five, ten. So we've, we've had students come for one class and go, no, I don't you know. They don't say anything; they just don't come back. And it might not necessarily be that they didn't like what we do; it just wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Or maybe we get um, kids coming to do it, and they think it's going to be like kids karate, like Pee Wee Karate or Shotokan Tigers, where they're going to be kicking and punching, um, playing some team building games, and then get the next belt. Um, so it could be that our expectation or the, the, their expectations isn't always met um, because of what we're trying to represent. No. But then we can't please everybody. I, 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 certainly in my years of being a teacher, I've come, I've had to come, I had to come to this realization. I had to come to this acceptance that for karate, much like anything else is either life or it's a phase. I think once, like once, once you get that into your head as a teacher, you actually feel a lot better about when people come and go. And, this and happens. Could, this happens everywhere else. And and I suspect whether you realize it or not, the quality of your instruction and the the value that you deliver to your students is increased because you know what it's like to train under someone who is karate as life and cannot wrap their head around any other perspective on it. I'd like to think I'm a fairly realistic person. I like, you know, that I, I, I keep these things in mind. I'm quite, I, I think I'm quite an aware person. I know that people have got other hobbies and interests. I got other hobbies and interests. I do. I, I'm in a band. You know, I play in a band on Monday nights. And what even do you play? that, even oh, I'm dr- drums and vocals. Mm. So I've got a bit of a Phil Collins thing going on. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, but he didn't like that. He didn't like that I had other interests. He wanted me to be 100% committed to karate. So even if it was something that this was, you know, we were practicing when there was no training. But then he expected whenever you weren't training you uh, a class, you were training at home. So I'm fully understanding because I do it myself. You know, I know pe- people have got, oh God, you know, I, 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 I work, I have a job, I have family, I have friends. I have, I have stuff to do outside of karate, outside of my training, outside of my teaching. And it would be hypocritical for me to not feel that way compassionately for other people. If, so people if, come up to me and they go, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry that I, I wasn't there on, you know, last week. I'm so, so, I'm not, 
no matter. You know, I'm not going to shoot you. It's, 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 you know, you were in there. It's fine. You know, and, and I'll, probably, I'll try and change the subject. And go, what did you do? I was like, oh, I had some family visiting. Oh, that's nice. Where did you go? I went down, went out, went out, had a bite to eat. Oh, great. I'm glad you had a nice time. And just sort of try and steer yeah. the, 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 the feeling in the room from sort of total, to, a totally apologetic student that feels really terrible what, about what they did. And I'm going, I'm glad, oh, yeah, what, did, what did you have to eat? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll maybe i go there. It sounds really nice. The, the only go, time... Oh, okay. <laughs> the only time I draw an issue is when the implementation and their their goals, their why, disconnect. If you have a if, if you want to get ready for an, a testing or a competition or or whatever it is, and you're not putting in the time to get you there, well then I might point out, hey, you know, you're not you're not setting yourself up for success. But for most of us, if something is going to be a lifelong pursuit or something we're, we're going to do at least indefinitely, you kind of have to have the rest of your life. If if martial arts betters your life, where's the life? Where are your friends yeah. and your family? How do you take the lessons in your training and make the world a little bit better? Hmm. I mean, I'll make that very clear from the beginning with new students. I go, you know, we have a we have a belt system, we have a grade system, and like anything else in life, the harder you work, the more you get out of it. Mm. You know, the more the more classes you put in and the more effort you put in, when you when that time frame comes and you become eligible, you more likely move on to the next belt. Some people probably argue and say that's not the point. But everything I teach has an underlying principle. And the underlying principle of that is you get out what you put in. Even if I'm not directly making that point, there's always an underlying issue. An underlying principle, yeah. which is that if you don't come to classes, don't then come to me in a few months' time and go, "Where's my belt?" And I'll go, "Well, no, I made it perfectly clear that that you have to you have to come to classes. You have to put the effort in." And I'm ho- I, I I like to think that whatever I teach in terms of principles is a generic enough principle that I, they could apply that to life like if i if i work hard at my job and i get i get you know I, I get there early i might stay on a little bit after work and i'm proactive i go to my boss and say is there anything you need me to do it just increases your chances of getting promoted mm-hmm. you know the, 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 there's always that you know that's what i like about principles they 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 they're not set to anything in particular you can carry around with you in your pocket and use it throughout your life I think sometimes people forget promotion, advancement, rank is for what you've done, not mm. what you used to do a while ago, mm. what we're hoping you're going to do in the future. It's what you've done kind of recently and where you're at and what you're capable of. And if there's a there's a hole in that, then the belt isn't a band-aid. It doesn't magically fix that. And I know there are some schools out there who will promote in hopes that it'll motivate people to remain and to to fix these things. And I, I get I get it's one of the few places I get quite bent out of shape because mm-hmm. I think it, I think it conditions them in the wrong way. Yeah, I always try to make sure that everything I'm trying to promote or anything I'm trying to incite upon my students is for the right reason. It's not for my benefit; it's for their benefit. I don't want people to come train with me so that. I get loads of students and my club looks awesome. I'm doing it because I'm almost providing a service. Well, I'm providing, I'm providing a service. They might never, they might never end up in conflict in their entire life. And I, Hopefully I, don't not. Upon, I don't wish it upon anybody, but if you can take something from it that you can adapt to life the same way that karate and martial arts has made my life better, it's made me a better person, that then, then I'll go to bed happy every night. There you go. So what's coming down the pipe for you? What's what's in the future or to say it another way, you know, if we were to connect back up in five or 10 years, what would you hope you were telling me? So one of the, one of the main things that I really want 
Somerset applied karate to represent is that there is the 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 wall, the metaphorical wall between teachers and students is knocked down. Mm. And I see more about that. <laughs> and I want I want to collaborate with people. I want students to collaborate with us. I want to collaborate with students. I I want to learn more. They want to learn more. So that whole thing about um, when you become a senpai or an instructor, you hop over that wall and you end up on that side. You're a teacher now. No, we are students as well. We we are going off. We're learning more. We're, we're going and training with other people. We're going and training in other martial arts. Get some other opinions. Get out there, meet people, network with people. The more I learn, the more my students learn. And I say the same thing to my students. My students go, I, I'll tell them, go off and practice other stuff. And I've done it many times where they, where some of them have gone off and learned something else. I go, come back and teach me. You know, what, what you've gone and learned, I don't know. I, you know, you know more about the subject than I do. And they sort of look at me like, what? But you're the teacher. It's like, no, you're the teacher now. You teach me. You're going, you've gone off to uni and there's no, maybe there's no karate club near the university. So they've gone and practiced um, Japanese jiu jitsu, or they do Brazilian jiu jitsu. So they might, okay, let's talk about it. What's the difference between Japanese and Brazilian jiu jitsu? Let's talk about it. And they say, oh, okay, cool. And so I guess in, that's what I want. In, in, in five or 10 years' time, I want to keep doing what I'm doing, which is to learn more. Because for my benefit, but also for the students' benefit, and obviously I'm one person, whereas I'm going to have an X number of students over the next five, ten years. So it actually will benefit them because there's so many more of them, more than it will benefit me. So again, it goes back to me having a responsibility to take material that is tried and tested. It it, it works and it's useful, even if you, you never end up in combat in your life it's still a useful life skill that i can pass on to people so i'm going to be i'm going to keep i'm going to to keep doing what i'm doing because that's not a pursuit that expires the smarter i get the smarter my students get and i want somerset applied karate to grow because it's quite, it's quite fresh. It's about six, about six years old, six or seven years old. Um, but I've got, a, I've got about twenty years of teaching experience behind me because of the amount of teaching I did in the old club. Um, so I like to think I've got enough experience to pass on to to black belts that are interested in being instructors and help them to mm. pass, on, pass on the same message. In that vein, I asked you a kind of a form of this question. I'll ask, ask you again now in a different way. I'm sure we have people listening who, if they've listened this far into the episode, likely one of two things are happening. One, they have recognized and taken some steps in their martial arts training because they recognize that there was more available or maybe they have we're we're kind of pulling them along and they're like you know okay but i've been training for this long and i've got this school or you know this pile of 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 entrenched this history this tradition that's kind of weighting them down and they're not quite sure where to go so here's the question if you could go back to and talk to you 6 7 years ago as you were stepping away from what you were doing into what you are now doing, what advice would you give yourself at that point in time? That's interesting because I, I remember exactly how I felt in that time. It was, it was, it seems like a long time ago, but it was a, it was a very big part of my life that maybe, maybe some people in my life maybe won't understand that falling out with your karate instructor is the same as falling out with any old friend, but this is a person that had a huge influence, probably the main, the main influence on my life. Especially if you start training with them at an impressionable age. Yeah, exactly. I I trained with him from the age of nine up to about the age of 27, 28. It's it's a third parent. Yeah. Yeah. What would I say? 
I'd well, I could approach it from from the falling out with my instructor point of view, but I can also from the the changing in my martial arts direction as to approaching the the the, the, the leaving my instructor, I'd simply say, "Don't worry." This you're going to realize that this is the one one of the greatest decisions you've ever made, and you should be proud of yourself for having the courage to stand up for yourself. You should be proud of yourself. Don't feel bad. Don't feel like you've let anybody down. This this is the best decision you're you're probably ever going to make, and you are going to become a better representative for what you do. Which kind of leads on to the other thing is that you're gonna this is how i felt at the time this is why this is why i say i remember how i felt it was like the only way i could describe it it was like being taught karate in a closet for 20 years and being taught everything in here is everything you need and it's like somebody opened a door and showed me that there's a hole there's a house, there's a garden, you go through the front door, there's a whole world. You, know, you, you, you don't have to practice everything that's in that broom closet. You, or you, you, you've got infinite number of things you can practice and people you can train with. And there's no one stopping you of, other than yourself or, in some cases, your instructor. And some people have the audacity to say, no, do you know what? I'm going to leave. I'm going to go and train with somebody else. I'm going to find another organization. Whereas I didn't leave for that reason. So I, I, I kind of figured that out for myself. I didn't have, I didn't have the courage to say I'm leaving because I'm going to do something else. That Hmm. was a byproduct of me leaving. So I actually thank the, the, the few crappy friends I had at the time, like, like Andy Kidd. He was a, he was a great bridge for me from where I was to where I am. Um, and also, uh, so my wife used to do karate and her, her stepdad was her teacher. And he was obviously, he was also very instrumental, um, with bridging me from where I was to where Mm. I am. Um, and my friend James, who does Wadaroo, he was another one. I went and trained with him for a year in his Wado club. So he was able to pull me in a direction when there, when I felt like there was no direction. Hmm. So if I didn't have those people helping me, I don't know where I would probably be now. I'd probably still be a bit lost. So I would also say to my former self, you know, you might feel like that you've lost a lot of friends, but sometimes bad things have to happen for you to realize who your real friends are. And I learned that from falling out with my instructor is that, I said no once and it destroyed the relationship. So I learned from that, that he wasn't really my friend. Mm. He wasn't my, he wasn't my mentor, but the friends that remained, they were the ones that sort of pulled me along and said, you know, come and do this, come and try something else for a bit. That got me to where I am now. So I'm eternally grateful to those people. So in general, I'm saying to my former self, you know, you're going to feel pretty, pretty awful for the next three or four years. And I did. I'm just saying, you know, it's going to be worth it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the place you're going to and the place you're going to go to is going to benefit you and it's going to benefit the karate community. And I hope it does. I hope it, I hope people benefit from what I teach and what I put out online. Awesome. If people want to get a hold of you, if they want to see what you're putting out online, how do they do those things? Yeah, so we put we put regular content on YouTube. Just go to Somerset Applied Karate. We have a Facebook page called website. Just search, search Somerset Applied Karate. And um, our online content also uh, it, it features myself and my very dear friend, uh, Sensi Greg Linham, who, again, is another very crucial part he plays a very crucial role in the future of Somerset Applied Karate. Mm. Um and he he has a lot to offer. 
he has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience um, and skill. He get he, he he gets out there. He practices all kinds of stuff. He takes what he likes. He strips what he doesn't like. And the same thing. It makes him a better teacher. And we feed off each other. That's why our organization is the two of us. Two as far as, far as we see it, two heads are better than one. Absolutely. So what final words do you have for the folks listening today? Any, any thoughts you want to leave them with? Well, certainly something I tell my students all the time, and I'm a personal trainer as well. And I, I say the same thing to my fitness clients as well. And it's the, it's the epitaph that I want to be remembered by end of my life, which is that, Hard work without fun is just hard work. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you can either take what you, take yourself seriously or what you do seriously. You can't do both. So that's kind of my my own worded way of saying it. Is if you're gonna learn something that's it's gonna be sweaty, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be physically hard work, mentally hard work. Make it fun. That's what I do with everything I try to teach. I try and find a way of making it fun so it makes it more engaging. Um, Because I was always taught, find the fun in it. find, Find the fun in hard work, which that's fine if you like hard work. And there are certain people out there that do, and I respect them for that. But yeah, if you're going to take a serious subject, Enjoy it, because like, like I said before, you, you may never end up in a physical confrontation in your life. So you don't want to get to the end of your life and go, "Oh, that was a waste of time." <laughs> you get to the end and go, "Yeah, I met some great people. I had some great fights. Went and had a drink afterwards and talked about it." Yeah, enjoy it, like you would any other activity. Sensei Joe, thanks for coming on, listeners. Thanks for listening. I really enjoyed this. I I always do but I always enjoy it for slightly different reasons. That's because all of our guests are slightly different people. My favorite thing about the format that we have for our interview episodes is it showcases how something that most of us think of is pretty similar, right? Training traditional martial arts can lead to such dramatic differences in people's lives and what they do with it. And here's another example of that. If you want to go deeper, if you want the show notes for this episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. If you want, you could tip us. You can make a one-time donation, in a sense, through PayPal. There's a link over there. But if you want to support us in other ways, you got so many. I'm not even going to name them. I name them all the time. You know what they are. I'll skip that today. If you have any feedback, I want to hear that feedback. Topic suggestions guest suggestions, ways we can improve the show, things that we should offer, things we should get involved in. All of it's good, and it's all welcome. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.